right. Well, I don't know if you ever made your own sandwich before. You ever made your own sandwich? But you go through that process and you're getting out all the ingredients, right? And you go ahead and you take out the pieces of bread from the loaf. And you got your mayonnaise and your mustard. Or maybe your peanut butter and your jelly. And you're getting ready to spread it right across the loaf as you make your sandwich. And as you're about to spread it, you look down at your piece of bread. And lo and behold, what do you see? Mold. Has that ever happened to anybody before? Now, I don't, I don't know if you're anything like me. But when that happens to me, I find mold in a piece of bread. I don't throw the piece of bread away. I go and I get the whole loaf. And I throw the whole loaf away. I mean, just one small amount of mold on any piece of bread in that loaf is enough reason for me to take the whole thing and yeet it straight into the garbage. Because mold is disgusting, right? I mean, when you see it, it is repulsive. You want nothing to do with it. Hey, you and I need to know something here this morning. The same way that you and I feel about mold is exactly how God feels about hypocrisy. He hates it. As a matter of fact, a verse you could write down in your handout is Luke chapter 12, verse 1, where Jesus says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus exposed the Pharisees as hypocrites, and the Bible says that a little leaven ruins the whole lump. And so he says about these people, even just a little bit of hypocrisy ruins the whole thing. See, when Jesus sees hypocrisy in people, he hates it. Which means that we here this morning need to be on guard against any of it in our lives. Which is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Everybody grab your Bible and open it with me to Matthew chapter 6 as we begin this series called Bad Religion. And our next three sermons here at United, Lord willing, are going to be a study through Matthew 6, 1 through 18. And today we're going to study Matthew 6, 1 through 4. And once you are there, I'm going to actually ask if everybody will stand back up for our public reading of Scripture so we can give God and His Word our full and undivided attention, show Him the respect that He so rightfully deserves. Matthew chapter 6, follow along as I read beginning in verse 1 down through verse 4. Jesus says these words and He's saying them to us here today. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. That's the reading of God's word. You can go ahead and have your seat. In Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 through 18, there is a clear theme of hypocrisy. Jesus actually uses that word hypocrite three different times in these 18 verses. Now, before you write this off as something that doesn't apply to you, oh, we're talking about hypocrisy here this morning for the next three weeks. Oh, well, that's not for me. Good thing that I'm here at church on a Sunday morning. I would never be a hypocrite. I want you to look back at verse 1, and I want you to notice the first word that Jesus says in verse 1. The first word in verse 1 is beware. Be aware. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness in front of other people in order to be seen by them. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, beware is very helpful. And the reason why beware is very helpful is because beware is a warning. And warnings are given to all people to help them avoid doing something that would be dangerous for them. And Jesus is warning people about doing something that would make them hypocrites. Which teaches us a very important lesson. Because Jesus says, 
beware of hypocrisy. That means hypocrisy isn't something that people set out to do. Hypocrisy is something that subtly happens to you. Which is why Jesus says, so beware. If you're not on guard, it could happen to you. Don't write this off like this is for someone else. And in these verses, Jesus is going to tell you to beware of doing three things. He's going to tell you to beware of giving, praying, and fasting. Now when you hear that, that sounds almost kind of like shocking. Jesus is telling you to beware of giving or praying or fasting. We wouldn't expect Jesus to say that. So why does he tell us to beware of doing these good things? Because you could even do good things in a bad way. You could even do the right things for the wrong reasons. So beware because this might just describe you. And if it doesn't describe you here today, beware it could end up happening to you someday in the future. So what is this warning all about? Well, in verse 1, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness, which is living according to God's commands. Your life is defined by obedience. But then he says, in front of other people, and then there's this key line right here that helps us understand the warning, in order to be seen by them. So the kind of thing that Jesus is telling you and I to be aware of here this morning is not obeying God. We should obey God. He's telling us to beware of obeying God for a wrong reason. That we would do what we do for other people to notice us and think that we are spiritual. Go with me to Matthew chapter 23 because in Matthew chapter 23 and we'll keep on turning back to this chapter multiple times throughout this series, Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees. He is pronouncing judgment on them and the thing that he is rebuking them for is their hypocrisy. And it says this in Matthew 23, look at verse 1. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you, but not the works that they do. And then here's a definition of hypocrisy right here. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds. So the good things that they do do, here's why they do them, to be seen by God others. Hypocrites don't do the wrong things. When we talk about hypocrites, we're not talking about those out there in the world who are not claiming to live for Jesus Christ. Hypocrites don't do the wrong things. Hypocrites do the right things, but they do them for the wrong reasons. That's a hypocrite. And the wrong reason that Jesus is saying you need to be aware of is that you might end up practicing righteousness. You might end up doing the right thing. But the wrong reason that we should all be warned of, that we should all be on guard against, is so that way other people will see us as spiritual and we will be like some kind of example and that ends up becoming pride in our hearts and minds. We all need to be aware of that. So I need to ask you two starting questions here this morning before we really launch into this here today. Two starting questions. The first question that I need to start off asking you here this morning is do you practice righteousness? That's the first question that I want you to think about with me here this morning. Do you practice righteousness? And this idea of practicing righteousness, it's not only mentioned here in Matthew 6 by Jesus, it's all over the Bible. Okay, let me show you an example of it. Go with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. Everybody turn there with me. When the Bible talks about this word practice, it's referring to what you do. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about how you live, what you think about, what you speak, what you do. So when it says practicing righteousness, that might seem a little confusing to you at first because when we think about practice, we think about like sports teams and going to practice for our sport team. But when the Bible uses this word practice, it's referring to the way that you live. It's referring to the direction your life is headed in. It's referring to your conduct, your behavior, even sometimes your attitude. 
And look at what it says here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. It says this, If you know that he is righteous, referring to Jesus Christ, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Here is something that you can be sure of. If you have been born of Jesus Christ, which is another way that the Bible talks about being saved, if you are a Christian, you will practice righteousness. Why? Because the Bible says that Jesus is righteous. And what is Christianity? Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. You have a relationship with God through Jesus. And so if you're saying you know the one who is righteous, well then what will that lead to in your life? A practice of righteousness. Which means something else that you can be just as sure of. If you don't practice righteousness, then you have not been born of Jesus. There is no such thing as a Christian who does not practice righteousness. Now there are two types of righteousness that the Bible describes. First, there is positional righteousness. Positional righteousness happens the moment that someone puts their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty and take the punishment for all of your sins and then three days later he rose from the grave and he finished the work that was needed so you can be saved and have a relationship with God the Father and go to heaven when you die. The moment that someone puts their faith and trust in Jesus and his finished work, they are now saved and they are declared righteous. And their new standing before God, their position before God is now no longer a guilty sinner deserving judgment. Their new standing and position before God is someone who has been made righteous through faith in Jesus. That's positional righteousness. It happens the moment someone becomes a Christian, the moment someone puts their faith and trust in Jesus, they are now declared right before God in their standing in a relationship with him. The second righteousness the Bible talks about is this practical righteousness. Practical righteousness is when someone who is first positionally righteous now goes on to live as a Christian in a pattern of righteousness. Their now life is defined by obeying God's commands and doing everything they possibly can by the help and power of the Spirit to stay away from their sin. So there's positional righteousness and then there is practical righteousness. Okay, you cannot practice righteousness until you are first positionally righteous. Okay, that is hypocrisy. It would be hypocritical for someone to try and live the Christian life without first becoming a Christian. That's fake. That's not real. But at the same exact time, someone who is positionally righteous Someone who is a Christian will go on to practice righteousness. So look at your life and let me ask you here this morning, do you practice righteousness? What is the pattern of your life? What is the direction that you are headed in? What are the things that you think about? The things that you say? The things that you do? Is it defined by righteousness and obeying God's commands or is it defined by sin. Those are the only two practices that people can have in their life. It's either righteousness because you know God and have a relationship with him through Jesus or it is sin because you are still defined by your sin and your self. Okay, the second question that I need to ask you here this morning, because we've got some people here in the room who would say, yes, I do practice righteousness, and it's not because I'm trying harder to do better, so that way I can earn a relationship with God. No, it's because Jesus has saved me. I put my faith in his finished work, and now I want to obey him. Okay, second question I've got to ask you, if you do practice righteousness, why? Why do you practice righteousness? Why do you obey God's commands? Why do you try, by the help of the Spirit, to stay away from sin? What is your motivation for practicing righteousness? Write this down for point number one here this morning. You need to check 
your heart motives. What are the reasons for why you do what you do? This is what Jesus is warning us about here this morning in Matthew chapter 6. Some people are trying to practice righteousness. They're trying to do the right thing. But beware that you don't do it for the wrong reasons. And one of the wrong reasons that people end up doing the right thing is so that way other people will see them and notice them. Now why would someone do that? Why would someone practice righteousness in order to be seen by others? These are just two examples of sinful, hidden heart motives that I've seen as I've interacted with hypocrites. Because I have interacted with a lot of hypocrites working with high school students who grow up going to church thinking that they are good kids in the church. Reason number one, they are fake. They are fake. They are not real Christians. But because they've grown up going to church, because other people in the church know them, they know that they're not really a Christian, but they don't want to come clean about that in front of other people because they're afraid of those people judging them. They're afraid of what those people will think of them. And so therefore, they practice righteousness in order to be seen as righteous by other people, but they are not really righteous. They are a fake Christian. They are a hypocrite. That's reason number one. Reason number two that I found why people will do this is because they are prideful. They are prideful. They want other people to notice what they're doing so that way those people will think that they are spiritual. Even sometimes it's kind of sick and twisted. We'll end up thinking things to ourselves like, oh, I want other people to think that I'm some like example that they could follow in. But really at the end of the day for a lot of people what it comes down to is it's really just all about you. And it's all about other people noticing you and the way that you live. And it's pride that is motivating what you do and why you do it. So here this morning, if you would say you practice righteousness, I'm asking you, Jesus is telling you in the Bible, check your heart. What are your motivations? What is the reason behind why you do what you do? And it's so sad because if this is the kind of person that you are, whether you are that fake person who knows you're not really a Christian, but you're trying to put this appearance for other people, or you're that prideful person, look at what Jesus says back in Matthew chapter 6 at the end of verse 1. I want you to see what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 at the end of verse 1 about those people who practice their righteousness in front of others in order to be seen by them. He says this at the end of verse 1, they will have no reward from their Father who is in heaven. Jesus makes it very clear. Hey, if you're doing what you're doing in order for other people to notice it so they will think that you're spiritual or you're doing it because you are fake. Hey, here's something that you need to know here this morning. There is a father in heaven who wants to reward his kids for the good things that they do, the ways that they obey him. But if that's you, if you're that hypocrite with sinful motives, you're not getting any reward from the father who is in heaven. And Jesus, he talks a lot in Matthew chapter 6 about this idea that God is going to reward Christians for pure obedience. Let me show you this. Matthew chapter 6, drop down to verse 3. Jesus says in verse 3, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Look at verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Look at verse 17. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then if you drop down to verses 19 and 20, Jesus talks about how we're living right now is either storing up for ourselves treasure, rewards here on earth, or treasure in heaven. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourself treasure here on earth, but by the way that you live for God, store up for yourself treasure in heaven. So that's five different times. 
Five different times in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus brings up this idea of the Father in heaven rewarding Christians for their obedience here on planet earth, which raises a really important question. And the important question is, should a Christian be motivated to obey by the Father giving them rewards? Should a Christian be motivated to obey God by the fact that the Father in heaven will reward their obedience? And you need to see, hopefully you're able to see it, clearly Jesus has no problem saying that. As he's exposing wrong motivations, he then says, hey, there's a kind of pure obedience where you do what you do in giving, praying, fasting, just because you want to please the Father The Father will reward that. And Jesus says that so often. And the reason why the Father rewards is because of the attitude with which this person goes about their obedience. In Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18, six different times, Jesus uses the word secret. I just read the examples for you in those passages. Three times, Jesus uses this word secret to refer to our attitude. The the reason why we obey. And then three times Jesus uses this word secret in reference to his father. And it's important for you to know what Jesus is saying when he talks about this idea of doing something in secret because he's not talking about how maybe we think about secret where you have to go off alone by yourself in some secret location. Jesus is not talking about location. He's talking about attitude. And the reason why we know that is because when he says you need to give in secret, pray in secret, fast in secret. We know he's not talking about location because therefore we would never be allowed to pray in groups. And we see examples in the scripture of people praying in groups. So Jesus is not talking about location. He's talking about how and why you do what you do. He's talking about your heart. Hey, even if you're in a group, Even if other people are around and it comes time to pray, is it like you're in secret and you're just talking to the Father? If it comes time to give, is it like, oh man, I hope other people notice this? Or oh man, I hope other people hear about this? Or is it like, no, I'm just doing this as if it were just me and the Father? I had a Bible professor in college who always, he always used to say this. This was like his most often quoted line. He repeated it all the time. Who you are when you are alone in your room is who you really are. See, it's easy to put this mask on when you show up to church. Like everything's going great. I'm doing fine. But who are you really when you are actually in secret? What Jesus is saying is you're supposed to, whether you're in private or public, you're supposed to be a secret Christian. And the secret Christian idea he's bringing up here in Matthew chapter 6 is not that you hide what you do. It doesn't matter if other people see it or not. The idea of the secret Christian is that you're motivated by doing what you do just because you want to please the Father. And I love this example in the giving because think about this example in the giving with me for a second. Look back at verse 3. Matthew chapter 6 verse 3 because Jesus says, When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, I I mean like, I love that because you got to think that all the way through. How does that work? How can you do something with your right hand that your left hand doesn't know about? I mean, that's a head scratcher, right? You're like, huh, yeah, how does that actually, how does that actually play itself out? And the idea of what Jesus is saying here is this is something that's so spontaneous that you don't even have time for other people to gather around and notice what you're doing. But when an opportunity presents itself where there is someone who is in need because you so live to please the Father and that's the motivation of your life, you're just going to meet that need. It doesn't matter who else knows about it. But one of the reasons why I love what Jesus is saying here, because think about this. If your right hand is doing something that your left hand doesn't even know about, it's really hard to applaud yourself with only one hand. You ever try to clap with one hand? (laughs) Doesn't really work. What do you need? You need two hands to clap. This is the idea Jesus is getting at here in this passage. Hey, do you want other people to applaud you? 
You want other people to clap for what you're doing? No, you're supposed to be a Christian who's just motivated so much by a desire of love to please the Father that it's like whenever the opportunity presents itself for you to obey, you just do it. Even if your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing, no claps needed. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want to talk about this heart that lives to please the Father and how that should be the motivation for every single one of us here today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at what, it's, look at what it says in, in verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6 it says, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. And what Paul's talking about is he's talking about the life that we live in this body right here on planet earth. As Christians, what would we rather have? Would we rather be in heaven or would we rather be right here on planet earth? Man, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely going heaven every single day. That, that, that is my desire. That is what I want. I want to be in heaven. So I would rather be away from my body and this life to be at home with the Lord in heaven. But that's not the case right now. I'm living in my body in this life. I'm not in heaven with the Lord yet. So look, drop down to verse 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. So let me ask you here this morning, what is the aim of your life? What drives you? What motivates you? What is, if you were an archer shooting a bow and arrow, what would be the target that you're going for? What's the bullseye? Because Paul's saying here, here is our aim. Here's the target. Here's the bullseye for a Christian. I just want to live in a way that pleases my father. I just want to live in a way that what I do makes him happy. Write this down for point number two. Obey to please your father. Obey to please your father. That is the reason why you're supposed to do what you do. And I want to get really practical for a few minutes with you here this morning because you might be in a spot where you are realizing, wow, this is something that you struggle with more than you recognized. You're trying to do the right thing, but it's more based on those around you, not just because it pleases your father and you love him. How do you develop a heart that obeys simply out of a desire to please the father? How does that happen? I want to give you four steps here this morning that hopefully will get you going in the right direction for developing this kind of a heart. Step number one, remember what you deserve. You need to take time on a regular basis in your life to think about what do you deserve? So you don't deserve a relationship with the Father. Is that clear in your mind? You don't deserve to go to heaven. You know what you deserve? Same exact thing that I deserve. To be punished and judged and sentenced to hell to pay for every single sin that we have ever committed for all of eternity. That's what we deserve. We have disobeyed God. We have broken his commands. We have gone against our creator and therefore we deserve to be judged by that God. That's what we deserve. We don't deserve the privilege, the opportunity of obeying the God of the universe. We don't deserve the, the, the joy of knowing him as father. No, what we deserve is wrath, is fury. And do you ever take time just to think about that? To remind yourself, to remember what it actually is that you do deserve? Step number two, recall the father's love. And see, this is so amazing. That when you know what you deserve... That God, the Father in heaven, he loves you. And he doesn't just love you in a small way. No, he loves you in the greatest display of love anyone could ever show. He put his son to death, Jesus Christ, to pay for all of your sins. That is how the, the Father loves you. And 
If you remember what you deserve and you recall the Father's love, do you know what that will start to do for you? The more and more you take time to think about this and rehearse these truths and preach them to your own soul on a regular basis, it will stir up your heart to be motivated to live in obedience to God simply because you are grateful for what he has done for you and your drive will be to please him. Who cares what other people think? Who cares if other people notice this? I'm doing this because of God. Why? Because of what he's done for me. The more you remember what you deserve, the more you recall his love, the more that you will be driven and motivated by a desire to please him simply because you love him. And this still might be a struggle for you. This still might be hard for you. This still might be difficult for you. Okay, step number three, pray for an undivided heart. Pray for an undivided heart. You might notice that your heart runs in two directions. One direction is, yes, I want to obey the Father. Yes, I want to do the right thing. And even in some ways, it might be because you have this desire to please Him. But also at the same time, you might recognize, man, I, like, I, I, I kind of do want people to notice me. And man, I kind of do struggle with that pride. And man, I kind of do sometimes do what I do so other people will see me. And your heart's divided, running in two directions. You need to pray for an undivided heart. Psalm 86 verse 11 says this, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Here the psalmist is praying and he understands what God has done for him. You've delivered me from death. You've saved me and given me life. And so God, I want to thank you with my whole heart. But so often in this sinful fallen world, our heart gets divided. And so he's asking God, please unite my heart to fear your name. Step number four, you could write it down like this. Be real about the struggle. Man, this is a struggle. This is a difficulty. It is not easy. And it sometimes will be an ongoing battle that you will have to fight and face in your life. And if you struggle with a divided heart, that doesn't mean two things. One, that doesn't mean that you stop obeying because you recognize there's impure motives in your life. No, if you're a Christian, you still need to obey God. And if you're recognizing that your obedience is motivated or driven by impure motives and the wrong reasons why you're doing what you're doing, that doesn't now mean that you can stop obeying and end up in disobedience. But also at the same time, it doesn't mean that you can become like some weird monk, some friar living in some monastery up in a cliff somewhere where, oh, I, I'm doing the, wrong, the right thing for the wrong reasons in order to be noticed by people. Okay, well, I can't stop doing the right thing, so therefore I've just got to live my life in private and I can never be around people. No, you will always be around people. Jesus saved you out of this world, but he did not take you away from the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. And so this is going to be a real struggle. And so what should you do? Well, you need to be real about the struggle. You need to share your struggle with the people in your small group. You need to confess it to your leader. You need to ask for prayer and don't just do it one time. Regularly share updates with your group on how this is going on in your life until it's done. And sometimes a divided heart can take time to overcome. But man, I want to encourage you this morning, don't give up. It can be discouraging, but the Lord is so faithful and he will give you exactly what you need to live in a way that is most pleasing to him. Here's a verse that I want everybody to write down on your handout here this morning. It's so encouraging. You should go home, look it up, read it. This would be a great verse for you to memorize. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. It says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is whole toward him. The Bible says that God is looking down from heaven. 
And his eyes are running all over the place, looking not just at what you do, but looking at why you do what you do. And what God is looking for is a person whose heart is whole toward him, whose heart is not just doing the right thing, but motivated by the right reason. You love God. You want to please God. And when God sees that person, he wants to strongly support that person. And what an encouragement. Do you want to be that person? I want to be that person. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 6 one last time and I want you to notice now what Jesus is telling us to do in these verses. He says in Matthew chapter 6 and I want you to look at verse 2 with me for just a second because he says in verse 2, thus. And I just love that word. I don't know about you. It's a word that we don't really use, right? When was the last time you were in a casual conversation and just dropped a thus? You're building an argument, right? And after you've built your argument, you're like, thus, and you go on to finish. Like, this is a word that we should say more often. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Now, this is a really interesting picture here of what these hypocrites are doing. They're going into the synagogue. They're going in to like what we would consider to be church. And there's the needy people there. And what are these hypocrites doing? They're sneaking their trumpets in. I don't know if it's a trombone. Maybe some guy's got the tuba. Maybe some guy's a little bit more like shy about this. So he's just got his recorder. But they're sneaking it in. And they're like, hey, we're going to give to the needy. But before we give to the needy, do 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 Everybody gather around. Watch what we're about to do as they give to the needy. And the clear picture that Jesus is bringing up here is, hey, the reason why these people are doing what they're doing is so other people will notice what they're doing. That is a wrong, sinful reason. They will receive no reward from their Father who is in heaven. They have received their reward because their reward is not coming from God. It's coming from people and that's all they're getting. And I love what Jesus says here about this idea of sound no trumpet before you. Because we do know as Christians, there is a time when a trumpet will sound. Do you know when the time is that the trumpet will sound? The time is coming where a trumpet is going to sound from heaven. And Jesus is going to descend. And he is going to call his people home to be with him in heaven. And on that day, you will stand before him. And that is when you will receive your reward. So don't sound your trumpet down here on earth. Let Jesus sound his trumpet in heaven. And that's when he will reward you. If you're tooting your own horn for what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. Now I want you to notice how Jesus says in verse 2 a key word on this topic of giving to the needy. He says, when, not if. You see that there? And he uses that same word three more times. Look at verse 5. Because when he's talking about prayer, he says, when you pray, not if. Verse 7, he says the same thing. When you pray, not if. Verse 16, drop down to this section on fasting. He says, when you fast, not if. This is important for you to notice. Jesus has an expectation that if you are a Christian, if you're following him, you will obey Obedience should not be an if, it should be a when. And so let me ask you here this morning, is obedience a when or is it an if for you? See, there are two kinds of people who call themselves Christians. One is when the opportunity presents itself, they will obey. Two, if they feel like it, they will obey. That first person is really a Christian. That second person most times is a hypocrite that needs to become a Christian. A Christian's life is defined by when the opportunity presents itself, I will obey. Go with me to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, because I got to ask you, which one are you? Do you give to needy people? And you might be here this morning thinking to yourself, hey, uh, newsflash, Shane, we're in the high school ministry and you're talking about giving to needy people. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the only thing these pockets are collecting are dust bunnies, bro. I don't got any cheddar coming from my part-time job. 
No money to be given out. Hey, well, I don't know if you've recognized this, but there are needy people all around us. And yes, sometimes it is physical needs that if we can, we should meet in practical ways to support and care for those people. But it's not always even physical needs. There are definitely spiritual needs all around us. There are needy people who need the gospel. There are needy people who need prayer. There are needy people who need help with their homework. There are needy people who need a friend. When you see someone in need, do you meet their need? Jesus says a Christian, for them it's when, not if. Look at 1 John chapter 3 verse 17. 1 John chapter 3 verse 17, it says it like this, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Like it's a question. Hey, if, if you would say you've received love from God, the greatest love anyone could ever receive, that we are unworthy, wretched sinners who deserve nothing but hell and punishment. And yet, you've received the Father's love. You've received the gift of grace in Jesus Christ. What an amazing gift that you get to receive. But then when you see someone in need, you close your heart against them and you don't meet that need. You think to yourself, oh, I'm too busy. Oh, no, not them. Oh, man, no, not me. This is a question. Is it really possible for someone to become a Christian by receiving the greatest love that they could ever receive, the greatest gift they could ever get, and then not go and meet people's needs? If you have received, you will give. And the reason why you give should be motivated because you have received. Write that down for point number three. Give because you have received. And if you never give to those in need, the obvious question should be, have you really received? Now don't be a hypocrite leaving here today trying to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. No, the reason why you should give, the reason why you should pray, the reason why you should fast is because you get to, not because you have to. Actually, when you leave here today, I want everybody, this is a practical homework assignment. Hey, trust me, this is not going to be hard. This is not going to, oh, he's giving me homework at church. What? What a lame dude. No, I'm not a lame dude, okay? I've got a mullet. I'm cool, all right? This is a practical homework assignment that anybody can obey leaving here today. Okay, when you walk out of those doors at the end of this service, I want you to look to your left, okay? And once you're past the bathrooms, and that's awkward, don't look in there, you will see something attached to the wall. Do you know what you will see attached to the wall? You'll see a water dispenser. That's what you'll see. Anybody ever filled up their water bottle at that water dispenser? Okay, now, I brought up my water bottle here this morning. Maybe some of you guys have noticed I like big water bottles because I drink a lot of water. Now, I've got a big water bottle, and it's not full because I've already been hydrating today. But if I came around right now, and I started, you know, let's imagine you guys all had empty cups, and you were like, oh, I'm in need of some water. Please, sir, help me. And I came around, and I started pouring my water into your cups. Am I going to get around to everybody here this morning? Yes. Guys, look at how much water I have. <laughs> Am I filling up everybody's cup here today? I don't have enough to give in order to meet every need. But when you walk out of this room and you look to your left and you see that water dispenser, will that water dispenser ever run out of water to give? No. What? How can these things be? Do you know why? Why, why is it that if I poured from my own bottle, I will run out. But if we went out to that water dispenser out there, it'll never run out. Because that water dispenser is connected to the source. That water dispenser is plugged in. And because it's plugged in, it doesn't matter how much it gives. It will always have more to give. See, if you try to do the right thing, because it's the right thing to do. 
You're doing it in your own strength. And guess what that will lead to? That will lead to bad religion. That's what that will lead to. You won't be able to do it. You will run out. You will find yourself burdened, feeling like, why can't I do this? But if you're connected to the source, if you're plugged into the life of Jesus Christ, if you have a relationship with him, if you spend time with him every day in his word and prayer, you will never run out of what you can give to those in need. And so I've got to ask you here this morning, have you received? Have you received the life of Jesus Christ? And if you're wondering here this morning, how do I know? Do you practice righteousness? Do you give? Do you meet needs? And I hope here this morning that you recognize there is a clear difference between a relationship with God and a religion of trying to do things because it's the right things to do. Don't end up in a bad religion. Have a relationship with God. Let me pray for us here this morning and then we'll respond with a time of worship. Father in heaven, we come before you right now and we thank you so much that you in heaven hear our prayers, that you are our Father and that you love us with a kind of love that is so much greater than what we deserve. God, we don't deserve your love in any way. We deserve nothing but your judgment, nothing but your wrath because of all of our sin. But the fact that you would love us by sending your son to die for us is the most amazing display of love, the greatest gift that anyone could ever receive. And so Father, I just pray for every single one of us here this morning today that you would help us to look at our lives and to honestly ask ourselves, have we received? And has it changed the way that we live our lives? Father, I pray for my friends here this morning who are in a bad religion, who are trying so hard to do a right thing, but for the wrong reasons. And it feels like they're just running up against a wall. There's no joy there. There's no passion there. There's no desire there. Even most times it feels like there's a lack of ability there. But help them to see that's not what you want for them, God. That's not your good path for them. You want a relationship with them where you will change their heart and make them new. And when you do that for them, obeying you becomes the passion, the love, the drive, the desire, the greatest joy of our whole lives. So help us to be a people that live our lives to please you. We pray this in your name.